Greetings, programs. This is Wretch, and welcome back to Shadowrun Hong Kong. Looks like everyone has something new to say here in Hoi, so let's go ahead and talk to everyone. Let's talk to the old men and the younger guy. Why, if it isn't the young one from before... Jin glances up at you, then returns to the game. Bah! Can't you see we're busy? Shiyu shakes his head at his friend. You never mind him. Is there something else you need? Thanks, good luck with your game. Appreciate it, young man. We'll be seeing you. Oh, so I guess nothing new over there. Looks like we can observe something from Reliable Matthew. The side of Matthew's trailer looks freshly scrubbed. It reeks of kerosene. Broad swaths of the flaking paint have been removed, revealing the brittle plastic siding, discolored by years of acid rain. You can still see the faded black traces of erased graffiti. It reads, Job Stealer. Something thwumps inside the trailer. You could easily peer into one of the windows. Okay. Inside are dingy, cramped living quarters, cluttered with broken drones and unwashed dishes. What looks like a rumpled, motley-colored shag carpet is heaped over about half the tiny space, obscuring most of the furniture. After a moment, the shag carpet moves. It rises about a foot and surges slightly towards the window. Then it stops, pulsing and fidgeting. It's hard to see clearly through the built-up grime on the window. Let's swipe the window. What's in here? The carpet is actually plush-covered drones. Teddy bears, raccoons, little dolls. There must be two dozen inside the caravan, all companionship models. They're all looking at you, as if they've realized you're not Matthew. They watch, fidgeting. Then, in one coordinated motion, they all lie down and go dormant again. That's weird. Matthew, you have anything to say about this? Reliable Matthew greets you with an expansive grin, sweeping his arms wide. Sean, beautiful! To so what do I owe this unexpected pleasure? While well, you're not here for some robotics, are you? Well, shucks. He rolls his shoulders ostent ostentatiously and sticks his cigar casually between his teeth. His eyes have a strained, bloodshot look. Hmm. Looks like someone vandalized your trailer. Huh, what? Oh, you mean the paint. It's just some neighborhood kids. Good kids, having a lark. I nearly fell over laughing when I saw it this morning. Why would someone call you a job stealer? No idea. <laughs> Drones are job makers. He waggles his cigar at you. I know what you're thinking, Sean. I think it myself. Drones take jobs. Well, medicine takes jobs from undertakers, and sewer drones take jobs from people who used to crawl through filth to feed their families. He holds his hand somberly at his heart, and his voice deepens. When you see a drone messenger or maid, it's easy to think, that used to be a person. Could be. Could be. But that person can do another job now, and they can have, <laughs> and they can have a drone themselves. Everyone is better off. Why... Matthew's voice rises. His smile wrinkles painfully around the edges as he carries on enthusiastically. The same people who call drone dealers job stealers often themselves come to me for... Matthew suddenly shuts up. His smile gets even more waxy. Uh, hey, let's not get all wound up about this stuff. It's too cheery a day for running off in our heads. Hmm. What exactly are the drones you sell used for, Matthew? Just about everything. They're helpers to metahumans in all sorts of useful ways. Drones cook, clean, carry messages, lift heavy loads, tend to delicate tasks. Why, drones can even care for the infirm and provide a companionship to children. Matthew taps his temple with his finger meaningfully. Think about it, beautiful. All the boring, dangerous, painful jobs that people used to do, the jobs that drones do now. He glances around at Hawaii and up at the walled city looming above. Despite his bright eyes and gleaming smile, his voice sounds almost thoughtful. Because of mechanization, we don't force workers to breathe as many chemicals in the refineries. We don't make teenage girls pick silk cocoons out of boiling water. Not anymore. Drones help us. He shakes off his passing air of seriousness, clamps a cigar in his teeth, and thrusts his hands in his pockets. They are really something, ain't they? How do people in Hawaii feel about drones? How do people feel about drones? Why, they love them! Just about every household that can afford drones has drones. You sure you don't want to try out this little UC2 tarantula? It's a great entry-level personal assistant. 
Rival Matthew smiles widely, but the edge of his mouth twitch uncomfortably. Drones free people to take skilled jobs. They make the economy more efficient, and drones give poor people services they couldn't afford otherwise. Mm-hmm. Wow, Sean. Just smell that brisk spring air. He inhales deeply through his nose, drawing in the fetid reek of the polluted river and the sodden heat of monsoon season. <laughs> this topic is fascinating. Really fascinating, but, uh, I've got to get back to work. Shall we walk the lot? I notice you have a lot of drones in your trailer. Reliable Matthew smiles serenely at you. Drones in the trailer? Oh, I think I have a couple in there. Probably ones I'm fixing. Hmm. Looked like a full playpen to me. Matthew shrugs uncomfortably. <laughs> Funny thing about drones. When you see a few, they always look like so many more. Weirdest thing, strange little fellas. Let's not talk about maintenance. It's boring. I bet there's something you need today. Interesting. Incredible bargains, huh? They fall off the back of a truck. Are you implying that they're stolen? If so, you're mistaken. He smiles indulgently as if you just said something in an alien language. This merchandise is provided only by trusted suppliers who certify the authenticity and workability of their goods. I don't furnish manufacturer certificates, but all the providers are really top shelf guys, really beautiful people. Otherwise, I wouldn't carry their drones. Hmm. Where do these trusted suppliers get them? I know, I think I, think I understand the situation. <laughs> Fantastic! I like to make sure all cons customers are thoroughly informed and feel completely comfortable with their purchases. Yeah, you take care there, Matthew. Yeah, we're definitely going to have some sort of storyline with him. I can almost guarantee it. Now, let's go ahead and head over here to the parlor and see what Crafty has for us. Any developments, ma'am? Hey there. Still don't know anything about the dreams, I'm afraid. I'm working on it, though. In the meantime, if you want to buy something, I can hook you up. Ah. Alrighty. Well, that was worth a shot. So some people have some new stuff to say, some don't. I think the only other place we haven't gone to is the Mahjong Parlor. And... Handsome Lee. Ah. We need to talk to Handsome Lee. It's muggy out, even for Hoi in monsoon season. You pause to mop your brow. Suddenly, you feel eyes upon you. As you glance up, you meet the tranquil, searching gaze of a, of a man half-hidden in the shadows. He's wearing a crisp, white, tailored shirt. Shirt sleeves neatly rolled, and a dark gray silk tie and smart black trousers. If he's sweating, you don't see it. The man tilts his head ever so slightly in greeting. A newcomer. Welcome. He flashes you a brilliant smile, eyes glinting with amusement. You can just barely detect a faint trace of an accent in his voice. Handsome Lee's the name, purveyor of enhanced sensory experiences. I can see that you've got some tales to tell. Hmm. You're not from around here, are you? His smile flickers briefly. He's got a decent poker face, but you can see that he's rattled. And, uh, <laughs> why do you ask? Hmm. You've still got an accent, Lee. It's barely there, but I can hear it. Ah, he fidgets uncomfortably. Uh, you're right. I'm not from Hoi. Keep going. I was born in Taiwan. I was forced to flee during the Nationalist War. I hear you have a slight accent as well. Seattle? Emphasis on the slight. The corner of his lips curls smugly. It's your move, apparently. Good guess. Redmond Barons. Handsome Lee suddenly fixes you with his gaze, sizing you up. His face is impassable. Nasty place. Hmm. It toughened me up. I've got nothing to be ashamed of. I know just what you mean. My own life experience has left me ready for anything. But can we discuss this another time? Yes? Let us now talk about business. I am a businessman, after all. So how about it, friend? He opens his jacket, revealing a myriad of small, bulging pockets sewn into the interior lining. Can I show you my wares? Let's see what you got. Are you the drug dealer? Yes, you are. Okay. 
I ran into someone with a message for you. Handsome Lee beckons you closer with a languid gesture. I think I can guess. Steven Dynamite? He coolly raises an eyebrow at you. Yeah, actually, that's right. And you're his dealer? He places his hand on his heart in mock indignation. I am the inventor of much acclaimed experimental pharmaceuticals. But why split hairs? Hmm. Well, your little guinea pig is suffering. Claims that a drug you sold him is giving him horrible visions. He pauses thoughtfully. Interesting. And what does he want from me? What do you think? He wants his new yen back. He strains abruptly from his elegant slouch and juts his chin out. There was absolutely nothing wrong with my latest creation. It was painstakingly designed to elevate the senses and titillate the spirit. A smooth high that I have indulged in myself. Now, if the unfortunate Stephen happened to dilute my masterpiece with other, lesser substances, I can hardly be held responsible. His tone of finality is unmistakable. Hmm. Yeah, you don't get it. I don't care whether your drugs work or not. I just want Stephen's money. He stares at you for a long moment, then reaches into his breast pocket. With a deft motion, he pulls out a small packet and presents it to you. There is no money. Not anymore. I have expenses, just as I'm sure that you do. But here, give this to Stephen with my regards. What's in the package? A freebie. It's what our dear Stephen Dynamite really wants, whether he'll admit it or not. Deliver it with my compliments. Hmm. I thought that only the first hit was free. He cocks his head to the side with a wry smile. I suppose I have a soft spot for my clients when I know they're down. Does this mean you poisoned him after all and feel bad about it? The dealer admits a long, drawn-out sigh. I most certainly did not poison him, or anyone else for that matter. If Steven is having bad dreams or coming from someplace else, I won't claim that my product can cure him of his suffering, but at the very least, it can provide him with some relief. Relief is the exact word that he used. The dealer nods sagely. I told you that I know Steven well enough to guess when he'll be desperate for another hit. So is his addiction the entire problem? Is that why he's suffering so much? Lee shakes his head slowly. No, I'm just not surprised to hear from him now, because it was time. But I can't explain these unusual dreams he's having. Anyway... He holds the packet out towards you and gives it a shake. And take this and give it to him. It should help him, at least in the short term. All right, Lee. I'll take them to him. Very good. Please let me know how it goes when you're done. A tranquilizing... Alrighty. So he just wanted some bliss was all. Now, Steven's up here near Club 88, if I recall correctly. And that gives us time to check the Techno Palace and everything else. All right there, Mr. Dynamite. Steven Dynamite lulls on the sidewalk. While he jerks less as he moves, his skin has taken on a gray hue and his chest heaves with each labored breath. His sunken eyes swivel towards you. He wets his parched lips and addresses you. Hello. I'm, I'm relieved to s see you. Thought you m might not re return. C can't trust anyone. This is a bad place. Hmm. Hey, Steve. I hate to say it, but you're not looking so hot. Fat tears begin to cascade down his dirty, ruined face. I, I don't want to sleep because of these nightmares. I'm ravenous. So ravenous, but food makes me ill. I've got the sh shakes real bad, too. I, I just want this to end. The junkie slumps in place. Throwing his brow, he responds with difficulty. Anyway, th thanks for, for talking to that little bastard for me. So, y you got my money? Yeah, Lee didn't have your money. He gave me the pass off to you instead. The junkie's eyes light up at the sight of the packet from Handsome Lee. Oh, hmm. I'm thinking that you might be better off if I held on to it for you. The junkie narrows his eyes at you. A hiss escapes his parched lips. Why would I let you do that? That's Lee's gift to me. 
Hmm. Because it isn't a gift, it's a trick to keep you hooked. The man snorts and lifts his chin high. It, it's, it's not a trick. I know exactly what, what Lee's offering me. I'm not st stupid. Hmm. Could have fooled me. If you're thinking of taking it, you are stupid. A wild look flickers in Steven's eyes. He bares his teeth and snarls. You just, you just want to keep it for yourself. Can't, can't trust anybody here. Give me my present. Junkie grabs your arm, ready to snatch the packet from your grasp. Ah, strength of five. I can't let you do this to yourself. You take another hit, and I'm going to hit you. Got it? The junkie cowers before you. His gaze blazes with anger, but he rel relinquishes his grip. Hope you feel proud of bullying sad sacks like me. I didn't really want that hit anyhow. I'm going to do you a favor by taking this packet away from you. His eyes glitter with tears. H yeah, sh sure you are. I am trying to help you, Stephen. And I want you to tell me about these dreams of yours. He looks ap up at you, suddenly suspicious. You want to ask about my dreams? Why? Hmm. Because I've been having bad dreams, too. Maybe we can get to the bottom of them together. He stares you in the eye, and his voice drops to a sharp whisper. These aren't like ordinary dreams. They're visions. They're so real. I, I put all kinds of substances into my body, and I've never experienced anything l like this. Hmm. Well, you were practically raving the last time we talked. Explain your dreams to me again clearly this time. He nods, though his tongue stumbles and stalls as he speaks. I'm wading through a series of... I'm walking through a series of d dark, narrow halls. It stinks to heaven. And I, I run towards more and more people as I move, move forward. The p people are j jostling me, but... but I'm starving, like I haven't eaten for d days. I just want some, some food, so so I press on. I th start seeing children in the crowd, ch children with t terrible b burns, dis disfigured faces. All these people are grabbing at me. He begins to tremble from head to foot, and his eyes bulge. Then I see t teeth all around me, and I, 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 I feel teeth on me. Bathed in sweat from an effort of speaking, he cradles his head in his arms. Hmm. Okay, Steve. Let's talk about the drugs. You said that you're on a lot of them, right? The junkie gives a wary smile. More than I can c count. I used to get my kicks from explosives. I love blowing stuff up, seeing glass splintering, solid walls disintegrating, flames l licking the sky. Not any m more. No, I stick to needles and p p p p pills. Were you a shadow runner? Uh, no, n not so much. I, I was a bomb maker. I designed c custom ordnance. It was a dream job, plus it was very lucrative. He rubs his thumb and forefinger together and snaps. Megacorps c couldn't get enough of the devices I invented. I was... T too high on my own e ego to wonder what they were up to. What were the Megacorps doing, then? They were fueling wars. They often managed to sell to both sides of c conflicts all over the world. C casualties be damned. So by selling to them, there's blood on your hands. The junkie's already sickly pallor turns ashen. It's not even as simple as that. The man balls his hands into fists in his lap. I thought my b bombs were used in wars against m militias, mercenaries, and armies, and I, I did think of them as people. But the w b weapons I developed were used against civilian t targets. The man starts digging his rough fingernails into his palms so hard that tiny crescents of blood stain his palms. I'm from Gizhu. Sichuan has taken over much of the province, but pockets of resistance r remain. There are big p political struggles, actions removed from the lives of ordinary p people. Yet the 
village where I grew up in was an annihilated. There were tobacco farmers, winemakers, peasants, not military. Tears streaked from the man's eyes, tracing narrow lines down his filthy cheeks. I recognized the distinct patterns, the traces that were left b behind. Those were my bombs, used to shatter the, the landscape of my childhood. Hmm. Uh, when your village was bombed, did you lose anyone that you knew? He meets your gaze with red-rimmed eyes. He throws his arms wide. I knew them all, from the frailest elders to the littlest children. B -b my own f family d died too. We weren't always c close. P Pyromaniac inventors don't fit in well with agricultural b backwaters, but, but they were my only k kin. Why would Suchuan bother to bomb a village? To break the spirit of the p people. It broke b mine. The junkie's shoulders heave and shake, and he passes a hand over his face. Now I j j just want to forget that the drugs help sometimes. Okay, Steve. I think that I'm getting what's going on here. I, I guess that I must be feeling g guilty about the b bombs, huh? All the b blood on my hands. I can feel it all the time. It's just like the bombs. I didn't want anyone to get hurt. He clutches his face, sobbing. How, how, how am I ever going to make this g go away? How will I live with myself? The, the drugs help me forget, but... He shakes his face, a look of utter hopelessness on his face. Or shakes his head. Hmm. Huh. Hmm. Well, you could start by helping some kids, or stealing your bomb semantics back. Helping kids? St stealing my... The junkie sways mutely in place, gnawing on his chapped lower lip. I, I would know where to be begin. Need time to th th think. Hmm. Well, children are the future, man. Find a charitable organization and put in some hours, for starters. The man lowers himself into a squat and hugs his knees, his gaze somewhat absent and his cheeks glazed with tears. I don't want to encourage him to take revenge on the megacorps because that could be more innocent people getting killed. There are a couple of shelters where I used to crash when I was less d down and out than I am now. There are a lot of f families I could help help out. The man pauses, licking his lips, his mouth feeling for the right words. But in the end, I probably need to go home to Gizhou when I can bring myself to. I t tell you what, I'll th think about it. He nods eagerly. I'll think real hard. Hmm. Thinking about it isn't going to be enough. You need to do something. Do or do not, there is no try. Yeah. Yeah, I, I w will. His face fills up with something you hadn't seen there before. Determination. I will. I promise. You know, there we go. That seemed like an interesting intervention. Wow, that was that was a lot more in depth than I thought it was going to be. Hello there, Maximum Law. Maximum Law surveys the docks from beneath his meticulously patched tarpum. Goggled and belted with electronics, his arms folded, his expression stern. A sweat-drenched little king, his boat rocks gently. As you approach, he looks sharply your way and breaks into an awkward smile. Hey, Sean, I was hoping you'd come around. You got a minute? What's up? Kindly had one poet burn your sin. Warriors you're doing work for her. Not normal yellow lotus stuff. Loft ships from foot to foot, and he fidgets with the hardware on his belt. Shadow running. Yeah, I'm now an unusual asset. Wicked, Law says it distinctively in a hushed tone, then seems to catch himself. He draws himself up to his full height. His usual demeanor of self-assurance returns. It's pretty ironclad, Sean. Pretty vicious. 
If you do good, you'll be noticed. Listen, if you got some info about runs, I can make it worth something. We Wampoans call that kind of thing metadata. Wampoans like to get the word on the street from the active operators. Worth something? Credits? Yeah, I could hook you up with something. Maybe creds, maybe some sweet programs. But really, you'll gain face with Ampoa. Accounts for a lot more than money. Law looks out through the rain, across the rocking boats. He wipes his foggy goggle lenses with a rag from his pocket, and his stomach gurgles loudly. Augmented reality goggles aside, this gig gets really boring sometimes. You ever want to talk shop? I'm here. Well, tell me about Wampoa. I was just there. We're pretty much the best, yo. What do you want to know? Law folds his arms impatiently as he's irritated by your request, but he can't quite stif stifle a proud grin. Hmm. Just tell me about the tribe generally. Who are you guys? Law smirks. You really are new to the Kong, aren't you? We're the Neo Matrix Collective. We run the Hong Kong Data Haven and the Kong Shadow Nets. We are the Kong Shadow Nets. Outside the corporate nest is the rest of the Kong, and in those shadows, you'll find threads of golden light like a vast spider web that carry information. Those golden threads and that web is Wampoa. I probably should have talked to him before we went on that quest. Law gives a curt viral nod. Or virial nod. My buddy Redstorm wrote that. Pretty wicked, huh? Anyway, we're bleeding edge on the path to singularity. We're doing things no one else is doing anywhere. Except maybe Denver or Tokyo. Our homeland is the Matrix, and we're building a society of truth and expertise and information. Hmm... What's a Wampoan doing on Kindly's turf? Are you a liaison? What am I doing here? Law seems shocked at the question. I'm an ambassador. I broker Wampoan services to Hoi. Emissaries like me are all over the Kong, trying tying it together in an invisible network. So you work with Kindly doing tech for the Yellow Lotus? Well, I do some work directly with Kindly, but my focus is more the street level. We're all a big part of the machine, each piece playing its critical role. Hmm. As is so with any highly evolved machine? Exactly. That's why nobody messes with the Wampoa. Boom! Does Wampoa provide any technical services for Hong Kong's poor? Sure we do. We run pirate networks. Our services are way more than most ordinary people want, though. You can get prepaid bandwidth with a corporate carrier for fractions of a new yen, but you're selling your soul. They monitor it. If you want to operate unmonitored by corporate algorithms, you've got to fly through the Wampoa network. It's the only place to be. Now, you guys are coders and deckers for criminals, is that right? We do tech for anyone in the Kong, outside the corporate umbrellas. Anyone can use our networks if they pass our vetting and can pay for what we bring. Law speaks without a shred of irony. It's mostly the extra-legal element that needs our skill. You seem very outspoken, less modest than many Hong Kongers. Is that tribal? I'm more outspoken, yo. I don't need the meat space rituals. Modesty is inefficient. He shrugs dismissively. Is that a Wampoan thing? For those of us who are most dialed, maybe, we're post-cultural. Law sweeps his hand around, gesturing at the surroundings. Hardly see any of this meat space. Our meat space headquarters is a big 20th century ship that's totally awesome. Whatever. It's just meat space. Wampoa is bleeding edge onto the path to becoming the singularity. And in the singularity, there's going to be nothing but straight up truth. Law punches his fist down on the ground, striking a majestic pose like a tritio barbarian. Boom. Truth. Well, thank you for telling me about that, Law. Outsiders don't understand us. Maybe you can, if you're really smart. We're in a whole different world than most people. Like, I'm seeing three streaming videos and live network stats in my goggles right now. Time's wasting, Sean. Hmm. Oh, okay. Here we go. Your elders hired a ghoul assassin to... I know! Those piss-drinking, pig-sucking... Law erupts into a tort of livid, awkward profanity. Some sort of pigeon of Cantonese and tech speak. Kind of, just how he talks and whatnot, he reminds me kind of Rufio from Hook. He catches himself short, pulls himself back together, and clenches his fists. You know whose fault this is? Ning. She always had it in for Magpie because Magpie was a genius. That turbo-snorting woo-woo idiot and her lackeys almost destroyed the Wampoan network. He folds his arms across his chest. I hope they string the bones of those morons from the gutters with a bunch of monofilament wire from the blessed autofab. 
Law pauses and looks over at you. I've heard all the rumors, but what's the full story? What do you know? We need to port this data out to the whole tribe. Hmm. Before I go on, you seem fond of Magpie. Magpie was the best of the bunch. She was a wicked coder and a Nova Hot Decker, plus she knew the infrastructure. Those of us in Magpie's bus maintain the Shadow Nets. That's what keeps Wampoa independent. Now we've lost Magpie and half the other elders, all that skill base is gone. All because of Ning got a bunch of cruft in her broads. It was her fault, I'm telling you. Well, I guess we can go ahead and tell Law the whole story. Why not? He listens to prolonged silence as you lay it all down. Now that's worth something. When you're done, he shakes himself as if awakening from a bad dream. Whoa. Law seems stunned. For real? Man, this is going to go down in tribal lore, Sean. Here, this is a cred stick I keep on hand for when people have special information. Take it. You've earned it. Kind of want to think now and share files. All right. You got to go? Okay. Watch your back and shoot straight and all. Law grins at you and Dexter flashes a hand sign that Shadowrunners give each other in Hollowvid shows. I got things to do too. How much New Yen did I get for that? I didn't even see. New Yen? Okay. That was a decent little amount. Got 908. Now, before we end the episode today, I know we're running a little bit long as normal. <laughs> but I'm trying to give the most thorough playthrough that I can, guys. So I hope you guys are enjoying that at least. Let's head in here. And talk to Ten-Armed Ambrose. See if he has anything new to say. Hey, my fellow countryman returns. You want some chips and dip? Help yourself. It's on the engine block. A spider drone walks past you, carrying a biohazard bag with a severed arm in it. There's a big Sahara Combat League race tonight. Everybody's coming over. You want to come? No, I bet Kindly's keeping you busy. You're from the UCAS Midwest. How'd you land in Hong Kong? While well, I'm eating some chips and dip. Ambrose bites one of his nails and regards you with a hint of suspicion. Well, that's a long story. I'm kind of personal. It involves some jobs, a girl, a real good reason to leave Chicago, a whole direct ton of guns and money. Hmm. Guns and money were involved? Sounds like a good story. Shadow running? Yeah, stuff like that. Ambrose smiles. He seems to warm up a little. I was a hardcore vehicle rigger back then, before Johnny Law cracked down on road rigs. Man, those were the cowboy days. Freaky as hell, but great to remember. Ambrose gets a wistful look on his face. We'd rebuild trucks and chop shops, reinforce the frames, bolt the armor on, mod the suspension with robotics, drive them right through the front windows of buildings, then bash aside Lone Star cruisers on the way out. Good times. You do that in Hong Kong, you get auto barricades and a missile enema. Crying shame. Anyway, uh, I needed to get out of Chi-Town, spread my wings. A nearby spider drone fidgets. You know how that goes. Are you following news of the Chicago quarantine? Ambrose's face darkens. Yeah, I am. It's a terrible thing that just happened there. My old hood is inside the containment zone. A lot of good peeps locked behind that wall. Supposedly it's insect spirits, but it's being covered up. I know. I saw the leaked material, too. Some of the footage is really convincing. It's pretty convincing. Ambrose shakes his head, sadly. Mega Vetus Plague, Bug Spirits. I'm not sure which is more scary. Well, Seattle's okay. Thanks, Drawl. Hell, maybe it's The Walking Dead. Think about it. We got at least four HMHVV variants. I only think it's a matter of time until we get zombies. Ambrose gives a nervous shiver. The nearby robotic arms tremble briefly. I take zombies over these bug spirit things, tell you what. Hong Kong seems like a long way just to go to get a break from Chicago. Ambrose smiles, but there's a steely look in his eyes. Sometimes, guy just needs a change of scene. A girl was involved in getting you here, huh? Yeah, there was. He shrugs awkwardly, as if to make light of it. His voice has a hint of strain in it. That's a story for another day. Hey, it's grand digging up the wreckage of the past, Sean, but time's wasting. I left Chicago, I landed in the Kong. After a while of running the Kong Shadows, I landed here, in Chrome Alley. That's really the gist of it. Yeah, we better get back to earning a living. Indeed. Cheers, Sean. Talk to you later. Well, good deal. Well, we've talked to all the denizens that I could see, and 
Looks like we had a successful intervention of Mr. Dynamite. Hopefully he'll be able to uh, kick his addiction and help out the community some. Yeah, he'll think about what I said. And we will go ahead and end it here, guys. We will head back into the base, talk to the rest of the crew, and maybe get our next mission. So if you guys liked it, go ahead and leave a like down below. Subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, that'd be a big help. And we'll see you next time. Later days, everyone.